I'm not going to present a whole series of slides, um, perhaps a little more um, literary presentation, if I could use that term. Uh, I've been looking at issues of democratic accountability and legitimacy in the context of this, of this whole process um, and how this process plays out politically and in the process of political decision making and eventually of political acceptance of what comes out of the process. Um, traditionally, the way we've done budgetary policy uh, in this country has been uh, rather deficient. Uh, I'm being very polite this morning. Um, the kinds of debates we tend to have can be categorized, I think, into some main sectors. We have a long debate every year on the finance bill. Uh, up to the time that we introduced this semester, uh, we had the sudden death budget. Uh, the government arrived into the Doyle with budget proposals. Uh, the Doyle accepted them or rejected them. If it rejected them, the, budget got the, the government got thrown out. Um, and we had this, this tradition that um, you kept all of this very confidential and secret until the day that it was announced, so you couldn't uh, allow people like me to go out and stock up with loads of cigarettes in advance of an increase in excise duties and, and so on. And that was the way it was presented. Um, and there was an afternoon and evening's debate uh, around all these issues, leading to a vote that evening, late that night, on the essential <coughs> financial resolutions, the things that had to be passed immediately so they could come into effect, uh, typically at midnight that night, uh, and setting up things that could then be brought in in the tax system subject to confirmation within X number of sitting days of the passing of the budget. And the debate on the finance bill usually turned out to be a debate that spent far more time talking about various detailed issues like tax reliefs rather than the overall strategy uh, of the budget. And it's, it's interesting that we, we tended, have tended always to spend more time talking about tax reliefs than solidifying the tax base uh, that we actually have. Uh, but that was really the context of what people regarded as the main heads of the budget. And that was followed sometime later, typically by a long debate on the social welfare bill. Um, I know the social welfare term has been changed lately, I haven't caught up with it yet, but there was a long debate about the social welfare bill, which was really um, probably the only occasion during the year when there was anything approaching a serious debate about distributional issues uh, in, in budget policy. And again, it was a debate on a series of proposals put forward by the government. Um, less dramatic if the government lost a vote on an issue in the social welfare bill, it wouldn't be regarded quite so much as a measure of confidence. But nevertheless, uh, it always tended to be the kind of debate where the government needed to get the measures in the bill um, passed, largely to ensure that the fiscal balance turned out the way it was intended to turn out uh, in the budget. We periodically had uh, debates that gave us an opportunity to look forward at overall economic policy uh, sometime into the future. Now, it didn't happen very often. Um, usually, it was the presentation of a new economic plan. Um, they tended to go out of favour after a government fell on a rather phony economic plan in October of 1982. Um, but they've been revived since then. Uh, although I haven't seen uh, any evidence of a major passionate debate um, on the latest uh, government set of proposals. Uh, perhaps that will happen in the course of um, the coming months. Um, the result was that there was very little um, passionate political debate in Parliament uh, about long-term issues. <clears throat> I think uh, we're coming to a realisation, though, that that's probably not a good way of organising uh, our, our economic policy. Um, if we take some of the major policy areas that are going to be important, given Irish demographics, if nothing else, um, education policy, health policy, and indeed climate policy, are all areas that require um, concerted action planned over a period of years. Uh, and typically, 
if you're going to do anything substantial in any one of those areas, given the demographics, um, you have to have some consistent line of policy that will last over the lifetime of sev several governments, or dollar, or whichever way you want to put it. But th they, they should be articulated over a longer period than our national one-year budget planning uh, framework. It's a difficult thing to do, as the current Minister for Health is finding out. Um, it's, it's difficult in a whole series of areas. Uh, I think we're going to have a very lively debate uh, over a period on education policy, again, given the demographics. Uh, we've been having um, a rather confused debate uh, about climate change policy for, for quite some time, and we're not alone in that. Um, the overall context, even within the EU, is a rather difficult one. Uh, but that's the kind of framework that we're facing, and that's the kind of framework within which we have to make all of the things that Michael has set out actually work and conform to the rules that have been set out there. I think it's fair to say um, that um, in operational terms, the process that's been outlined has been digested officially, and I think Michael McGrath's presentation this morning uh, certainly showed that. Um, has it been digested politically? I think not. And I think that part of the problem has been uh, that, that we talk about democratic legitimacy and accountability, uh, and I would think, I doubt if anybody here would disagree with me uh, when I say that conventional wisdom today would have it that we don't have a broad democratic acceptance uh, or a perception of legitimacy um, in the current state of economic policy. Uh, we don't have a firm belief uh, that we can have confidence in the political system in delivering something comprehensible and acceptable. Um, uh, and that's as may be, uh, I think uh, we will always have criticisms to make about our political system. But it seems to me there's an element that we should add to concerns with democratic legitimacy and accountability, and that is comprehension uh, of the public. And that's a, 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 an element that I think is absent from our current debate. The current debate is austerity versus expansion and all those nice things that, that, that we talk about. But it seems to me that there is an element that our political system has not brought to the fore. And that's a simple reflection on what happens in the cycle of boom and bust uh, that, that we go through. It, it's horrible for the people who suffer, uh, undoubtedly. But there's very little uh, talk about what actually happens. When you have a boom, wealth is created. Sometimes very substantial wealth is created. Um, in Ireland, it took the form uh, partly of real wealth in terms of infrastructural development that we did that was long overdue, partly of financial wealth, which looks real to the people who have it because you can buy a lot of things, partly of property wealth. What happens in a bust? What happens in a bust is that a big chunk of that wealth that's been created is destroyed. That's what happens, that's what made us pay 60 odd billion euro uh, to bail out banks. It is massive destruction of wealth. And if we're talking about democratic legitimacy and accountability in economic planning, we have to have some understanding of where we're starting from. If you go through a boom and a bust, if you're really lucky, at the end of the bust, you'll end up in real terms, in terms of real income, just about where you were at the beginning of the boom. If you're unlucky, you'll end up worse off than you were when it started. Happily, I don't think that's our situation. But you certainly end up a lot worse off than you had become used to being uh, during the course of the boom. So it seems to me there's an element there that we haven't yet brought in to the discussion. And the question I have is whether in the operation of the kind of process that we've been talking about here, a greater understanding of what that means uh, can actually inform uh, the process of, of, of policy making. Um, looking at that process um, in, in the discussions we've had in the group, 
Um, I produced the paper that we had last summer, Democratic Legitimacy and Accountability, which I don't intend to go into in any detail here. Um, I'll take it as read if you have the patience. If you don't have the patience to read it, um, I have a summary edition, uh, which I think deals with the main uh, parts of it. But I made five proposals for consideration in that paper. The first one was that in the context of this process, um, the Doyle should discuss and adopt an opinion on the European Commission's annual growth survey, which is produced in November, before it's debated by the European Parliament and adopted by the March meeting of the European Council. If the government is going to participate in a process that's going to shape economic policy in the Eurozone, uh, at least, then it seems to me that if we're concerned about democratic legitimacy and accountability, it should hear what our Parliament has to say about it. And the Parliament itself should take the opportunity to express a view. Um, so that's number one. Second, the government has to submit a stability or convergence program um, to the European authorities, uh, to the Commission, in April. Again, it seems to me that if we're going to take democratic accountability and legitimacy seriously, that programme should be discussed in Parliament before it's presented uh, to, to the European Commission. Um, third, and this hasn't been a concern for us up to now because we've been in a programme, uh, the Commission uh, puts forward country-specific recommendations for economic policy in, 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 in May, uh, and they are to inform the, the, the formulation of the government's uh, budget proposals. Again, it seems to me that those issues should be debated by the Doyle so that the government can be informed by um, what the political system has to say and receive any wisdom that it may have to offer on the issue. I came to a fourth um, proposal um, which homed in on the fact that in the presentation, the budget proposals put forward by the government on the 15th of October are proposals, and that the Commission is entitled to comment on those um, before they're finalised. And it seemed to me uh, that that presented an ideal opportunity for a parliamentary consultation um, before these proposals were put. And that instead of having the sudden death kind of budget proposals that we have, that it should be preceded by a debate that would have to do with the balance of fiscal policy with the content uh, of the measures that were put forward before the government put proposals that had to be commented on by the Commission. As it turns out, that was an extremely naive proposal. Uh, because, of course, politically, a government is not going to bring proposals to Parliament unless it's sure that the Commission is not going to shoot them down. Um, now, it's not 100% naive, it's maybe about 90% naive, because I note that Michael has um, made the point that the Commission actually did express some reservations about the proposals of five member states, indicating that it thought that perhaps they would not achieve their targets unless they took action in the meantime. I suspect, politically, that that's about as near as a severe rap on the knuckles uh, that the Commission will give to Member States. I think the Commission and the Member States will move heaven and earth to make sure that there's almost, if not complete agreement, then as good as uh, agreement on budget proposals uh, before they're put before the national parliaments. That suggests to me that while that proposal was a very naive one, it makes the previous ones uh, that I've put forward even more important because they're the opportunities that we have for a really um, meaningful political debate uh, on the balance and the content of, of government proposals. And the fifth proposal I put forward for consideration was that the government, uh, the Doyle uh, preferably, uh, there's another debate in there that I won't go into, uh, but somebody effectively uh, should establish a dedicated budget committee uh, in the Doyle, because it seems to me that if we look at the complexity of that process and the depth of the issues that we have to deal with in the future. Um, and we're certainly going to be dealing with these issues for quite some time. I don't know, Michael, 
how long it's expected to be before we pay back 75% of the bailout loans. I think it's going to be quite some time. These issues will be important uh, for that time. Uh, and it seems to me that there is work to be done uh, for a parliamentary committee. Um, if I were being rude, which I won't be, I would say a parliamentary committee that doesn't grandstand in the way that some of them have up to now, but since I'm not being rude today, I won't say that. No. Um, I had a look then at what actually has happened um, in, in the Doyle um, while this process has been uh, put in place. It's had, this process has already had a very clear uh, impact on the work of the Oireachtas Joint Committee on Finance, Public Expenditure and Reform uh, during the course of 2013. Uh, I was mightily impressed to find that the Vice Chairman of the Committee, Liam Toomey, uh, said in, on the 10th of April last, <laughs> I read the whole quote, he said, we must seek to make the European semester process part of the DNA of this committee. Because once the process becomes fully operational, the committee will have an opportunity to offer its views on the revised budgetary framework. Uh, there was a little more. He was looking forward to a meeting uh, with representatives of the commission uh, and a meeting with the, the minister to discuss the draft stability programme. Um, and he said, we will learn how to better structure our engagement in order that when Ireland exits the current economic adjustment programme, the committee will be ready for full engagement and there will be far more meat on the bone as the full value of the European semester becomes apparent. And I find that extremely encouraging because it indicates that there is, um, at some levels uh, in our political system, um, a readiness, an appreciation of the importance of getting involved in this process in a more meaningful way uh, than, than had been the case up to now. <clears throat> the Joint Committee, I should say I'm going to talk about the Joint Committee. Um, the Finance Bill Committee stage is dealt with by the Select Committee of the Doyle. The Senators aren't involved in that. And, and I'm not going to talk about any of the debate they had on the Finance Bill for reasons that I mentioned uh, earlier on. But the Joint Committee held 35 meetings during the course of the year and of those, 12 were either directly or substantially devoted to matters concerning or arising from the European semester. They had three debates directly on phases of the semester. They had two discussions uh, with the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council. <coughs> there were two meetings that were concerned with forthcoming ECOFID meetings. They had two meetings with the Governor of the Central Bank and they had one meeting with the National Treasury Management Agency. Um, one meeting um, dealt with a scrutiny of EU legislation, um, part of it to do with issues arising from the, uh, the semester. And one meeting was devoted to a review of pre-budget submissions. Um, that incidentally was rather interesting because they looked at two sets of pre-budget submissions. Uh, one from... Um, a group of, um, I think they call themselves think tanks, uh, that would tend to be rather on the left, um, and the other devoted to pr proposals from a group of think tanks uh, that one would tend to regard as being on the business side, uh, and therefore probably in political terms a little to the right. Uh, but there was clearly an attempt to look at a fairly wide spectrum of, of proposals. Um, they had the good sense to follow uh, a procedure laid down many years ago by Rory Quinn when he was Minister for Finance and he said, I'm not going to meet all the people who send me in pre-budget submissions. That was a process that was guaranteed to send finance ministers out of their minds uh, for years, you know, listening to all these things. Um, a number of debates in plenary session of the Doyle touched directly or indirectly uh, on matters relating to the European semester. Um, second stage of the finance bill, the general debate on the finance bill um, uh, raised a number of issues um, about <clears throat> the semester. Um, Michael McGrath, for example, spoke of the need for a tracking mechanism to assess the effects of budget measures. 
uh, and raised issues concerning the redistributive effects of fiscal policy, which is one of the concerns uh, in the semester process. Um, Deputy Pierce Doherty also referred to distributional aspects and referred to concerns with the need for stimulus measures. So uh, it, it seems to me that there is uh, a recognition in that Doyle debate of how the semester uh, was becoming important and how the issues raised there were important for the, the, the overall design uh, of economic policy. Um, again, issues relevant to the semester arose during the course of Doyle's statements on the 13th of March in advance of that month's European Council meeting and again on the 23rd of October in advance of another European Council meeting. In March, the Taoiseach referred specifically to the semester process uh, and measures to strengthen economic governance of the EMU and to strengthen democratic accountability. Uh, during that exchange, uh, Michal Martin questioned the emphasis by the Eurogroup, the Eurogroup on fiscal control as a means of addressing the crisis and criticised the lack of a common discipline for stimulus measures. In October, he took issue, Michal Martin took issue with what he described as a lack of meaningful debate in the Doyle in advance of European Council meetings. Now, uh, when he has, um, he undoubtedly has a point there, um, I, I'm bound to remark that that's a point always made by political parties in opposition and always ignored by political parties in government. Uh, but it seems to me to be a fair point to raise in the context of um, a semester process that invites or leaves room for national parliaments uh, to play a bigger role than they have heretofore. And I think it would be a fair um, comment to make to our own parliament and indeed to all national parliaments that they have at least the same obligation uh, to contribute to the process as the European Parliament has. Um, and there's a reality there which I think our, our national parliaments haven't yet really understood. Um, it's become even more important since um, the Lisbon Treaty. Um, I, I've often made the remark that um, as a Doyle deputy for 21 years, uh, part of the time I was in government, I would have given my right arm to be in a parliament that had the same budgetary functions as the European Parliament had even before uh, the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, because from, from 1979 on, the European Parliament has had the ability to modify um, the European budget, sometimes not by very much, but it's had the ability to modify parts of the budget in a way that members of Dáil Éireann never could. It has always annoyed me, for example, as a former deputy, um, that a, a member of the opposition may never put forward uh, a budgetary measure in the context of the finance bill discussion that would increase expenditure. It's simply out of order. It seems to me that in a democratic parliamentary system, uh, that is a rather silly thing to do. You might say you can do it as long as you say where the savings are going to come from to pay for it, but that at least would be um, a major advance. In measures that would help to improve democratic legitimacy and accountability. Accountability, certainly, but I think legitimacy also. We then had uh, the, 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 uh, the budget um, proposals on uh, October the 15th, uh, with the result that, that Michael has said, the, the Commission uh, didn't have any uh, adverse comments to make uh, about Irish budgetary policy. Um, so if I may be permitted a slightly political comment, it's clear that the whole thing was readied up between the government and the commission before they went into the door. That's, that's maybe a smart house way of saying that they did the sensible thing. Um, as a commentary, um, I think the, the process that's happened over the years suggests to me that there's the beginning of appreciation in our political system of both the opportunities and the obligations uh, that come from uh, the European semester process. Uh, and I would hope um, that uh, we will see um, 
quite soon that our political system will digest the process in the same way that our official system uh, seems to have done. And I think it's, it's pretty clear from the way presentations have been made that both the Department of Finance and the Department for Public Expenditure and Reform have really begun to internalise what this process means. Uh, we need um, our political system uh, to begin to do that. One final point I'd make is that I think it was important that during the course of the year, uh, the Doyle Committee dealing with these issues had two discussions with the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council. Um, the Fiscal Advisory Council uh, has become, I think, familiar to people who talk about policy debates. Um, and it seems to me uh, that uh, it's an innovation that is worth building on. Um, as a suggestion that, that, that I made yesterday to a member of the Fiscal Advisory Council, who shall be nameless, but he's sitting just there, um, that it would be useful as part of this process if, in addition um, to, to doing the validation exercise uh, on government proposals that is currently in our process, uh, we would have um, a contribution from the Fiscal Advisory Council post hoc assessing the effects of government policy. And I think over a period uh, that would develop that would build up uh, a corpus of um, analysis and interpretations that would certainly help uh, in the formulation or the achievement of a greater degree of democratic legitimacy and accountability for our budget process. Thank you. Thank you.